I was a little girl, I wished I was a boy. I tagged along behind the gang and wore me corduroys. Everybody said I only did it to annoy, but I was gonna be an engineer. Mama told me, can't you be a lady? Your duty is to make me the mother of a pearl. Wait until you're older, dear, and maybe you'll be glad that you're a girl. A dainty as a dress and statue. So thank you very much for, for talking to me. You said on page 373, my political life has intertwined with songwriting. And whenever I hear a reference to you, it's a folk singer and political activist. Mm-hmm. The two go hand in hand. Are you comfortable with that? Is that a balance that yes. you wanted to achieve? Or well, you I'm set not out? as political an activist as a lot of people are. Writing song... I suppose that's political activism, but the activists are the ones who lie down in front of tractors at the the fracking places. They're the ones who go to, you know, Lesbos and help with refugees. Those are the, to me, the real ones. Um, But then everybody doing what they can and what they do best, you know, trying to, 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 to match up to what you think other people do is not a good idea. And I have written some songs that have kind of made a made a made a mark. The two songs I'm most mostly known for are "Gonna Be an Engineer," yeah. which is a feminist song, and the Ballad of Spring Hill, which I wrote back in 1959 somewhere, 58, about a uh, a, a pit disaster in Nova Scotia. Down at the coal face, the miners working rattle. The belt and the cutter's blade. The rumble of a rock and the walls close round. Living and the dead men two miles down. Living and the dead men two miles down. Uh, and those are the ones that people always seem to refer to. However, A lot of my songs are known hither and yon. One of them is being used uh, for humanist funerals. Uh, One called Love Call Me Home. Um, Others of them are being used for anti-nuclear and uh, against the poll tax way back. Uh, I I sometimes feel a little guilty when I'm called an activist. The most activist thing I've probably done was sitting down in Parliament Square against cruise missiles and being arrested. That's first world activism, uh, which is, it it has its points. I seem to have a song about most everything, and that's interesting. When you were growing up, um, your mother was a classical pianist and composer, Mm -hmm. and your father was an ethnomusicologist. Mm -hmm. So you were really, were always in that world, weren't you, from... Mm. It, you absorbed that world growing up. Mm. It wasn't a political upbringing. It was a progressive upbringing. Uh, we called ourselves progressives. You, did, you never called yourself left-wing in the circles that my parents were in, although my father had been a member of the Communist Party back in the 30s. Okay. Um, my mother had uh, definite feminist leanings, but it was gently pushed down by my father, uh, and she wanted children. And so that got in the way of her classical playing. And, and the family finances dictated that she needed to be part of the money earning. And she was an excellent piano teacher. And I would have said that piano teaching, the way she taught it, is a vocation. It's a profession. It's a career. You're not just a piano teacher. She was brilliant, absolutely brilliant piano teacher. Um, so that's what I grew up with music all around and one of the main things that we learned was that music was meant to be listened to. You didn't talk while music was going on. If a piece was started and you had something to say or you were interrupted, wanted to interrupt, you didn't interrupt. You waited till the piece came to an end or the song came to an end and then you talked. You didn't interrupt music. You know, these days music is meant to be ignored. Yes. Or it's yeah. meant to drown out every possible possibility of conversation anywhere. I feel sometimes that the value of music is just being undermined mm, all the time. It's something that's background. 
And it's something that divides people, I think, more than puts them, brings them together. But that's depending on the kind of music. The folk song clubs, I think, are kind of like oases in the musical scene because anybody can go there and cut their teeth on being on stage, sometimes disastrously. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but but anybody can participate in producing music, which I think yeah. is possibly more important than consuming it. So when you started to learn, you you learnt piano at six, I understand, and then started, yeah. guitar at ten, mm-hmm. and you've just gone on and mm. developed. Yeah, and I le- I I when I came over here, I had piano and banjo and guitar. I never used the piano on folk music, and I still don't. Uh, but the guitar and banjo, that's what I turned up with. I started playing the auto harp um, because certain songs seemed to need it. I started playing the concertina purely and simply to accompany Ewan McCall because it's an English-sounding instrument and the guitar was being overused here. Uh, the dulcimer is a very sparse instrument and it sounds wonderful with the old songs. So that's what I play. And I presume at the time when, when you were travelling so much also, it was the ease of banjo. being able to, you're not going to take a piano with you, are you? So. Yeah. Well, that's one of the main things about folk instruments is that they are portable. There's a story in that book about a collector who went to the, to the Hebrides. You'll find it there if you give me the book. And his name was Jerry. So this was Jerry's thing. He filled up the back of his... A state car, American estate car, over here with yeah. the most fantastic recording equipment. And uh, he went over to the to um, uh, to Sky or something like that. So it was hell itself getting the vehicle over to the remote island on the microscopic ferry. It was hell itself transporting all of the equipment halfway up a mountain by Jerry Power to the little croft where his singers lived. It wasn't heaven setting it up for the first time ever while his singers sat watching by the peat fire. Machine, mics, tapes in place. Now, where do I plug in? Och, laddie, we have no electricity. <laughs> you know, that actually, yeah. it actually happened. And he came back laughing about that. Um, so was that so s- portable, similar? you have to be portable yeah. with folk music. Yeah. You really do. Your so, voice so is your you, first instrument, of course. You take that anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was just going to say what he was doing was similar to what Alan Lomax was doing in mm-hmm. the States. And your your mum helped... Well, my mum never collected. No, but did she collate? Did she work for Yeah, her? she worked for the Lomaxes. So again, you had this yeah. background this, of this traditional music. song... Well, and... I have the two, the yeah. two extremes. I have classical music, I have folk music. What lies in between that incredible outpouring of, of popular music of all sorts, you know, jazz, hip-hop, rock, soul, gospel, da, 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 all that in the middle, uh, I know very little about. You know, I delve into it and I like a lot of it and I hate some of it. I have came to music, folk music quite late and I only realised what I would term classical composers like Vaughan Williams mm-hmm. were playing folk music. But no, they weren't. But they took folk tunes and turned it into classical. Turned it into classical, okay, yeah. I can understand sitting down and writing a song, but I couldn't really understand where the, li- the lineage lay with traditional song. But you have that mm-hmm. background. It's just in you, isn't it, from the word go? And I learned yeah. the songs at the same time as I learned the style of singing. I have done things with it because I had a classical education mm-hmm. and also because I, didn't, I wasn't brought up on the front porch of an Appalachian cabin. I was brought up in a musically savvy family and I got a very good classical education and uh, <clears throat> I don't imitate. Yeah. I don't imitate other, you know, the, 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 the folk singers. I can't. I was brought up in middle class Washington. Yeah. It would just be false to do that. Certain of the songs you can, you can try because it's silly singing them in Washington sound or whatever it is I've got now as a way of speaking. But the style of singing is important. And when you sing folk songs with a bel canto opera voice, you take away one of the main features of it. The same way as if you were singing um, La Traviata and sing it with the high lonesome sound of the Appalachian Mountains, it wouldn't be opera anymore. 
you know, it, when you yeah. when you talk about a type of music, you're not just talking about the words in the music. You're talking about the style of singing it. And folk singing is just it's modest music. And it's very easy to turn it into something immodest and and pretentious. Um, you know what Vaughan Williams did? He said he he said he took folk tunes, but he never called what he wrote folk music. He didn't call it folk music. He called it Vaughan Williams. So I'm very sticky about when you ask me about folk music because I have a definite, very pronounced prejudices about folk music. It gets me in trouble, but then. Trouble's fun. Talking of trouble, you have uh, you've you've courted quite a lot, haven't you? Courted trouble. Well, I was amazed that. Um, no, I was you adventurous. Tra you travelled to Moscow and China mm. when you were twenty-two. Mm-hmm. I did. I, it was great. Barely left my bedroom at twenty-two. That's your fault. Well, okay. <laughs> well, there's places to go. My now, grandchildren, my granddaughters, both of them got out of high school, what we call high school here, and during their gap year they went to Thailand. But that's more that's more usual now, isn't it? I mean it is it is not as uncommon as, as It was uncommon what? for a solo woman to do what I did. You know, I just wanted to do everything. And I did, which is why I was probably ready to settle down at twenty four with you and McCall. Because I was tired of living out of a knapsack. I don't know the background to the McCarthy era or anything, but I think your father had, was blacklisted, wasn't he? Well, he was about to be blacklisted when he quit his job. Pete, uh, Pete, if Pete was the, blacklisted. Yeah, yeah. My father wasn't. My father but if he'd been in the Communist Party, presumably he was on the on a list mm -hmm. somewhere. I don't um, think Pete was ever in the Communist Party, but I don't think he ever said yes or no. <laughs> but, it, but he was brought up in front of the House on American Activities Committee, and he got a, a sentence of a year in jail, which later was uh, uh, repealed. He never did it. Um, McCarthy, you know, it would be very easy to bring McCarthy back now. It would be very easy, mm. Mm. Uh, just waiting for it. But it was a very interesting period. But it was a period when, when, after the war, when everything was up in the air. Nobody really knew what was happening. And all kinds of mores and morals and ethics and the philosophy of life was just being turned upside down. Uh, co consumerism was coming in, and ooh, you know. So I was part of that, and my father was wonderful. He never objected to the fact that I headed off by hitchhiking in in, in Holland in the winter when I was quarrelling with my sister-in-law, and I just got up and left on the thumb. Uh, so it, I did have an adventurous streak. Absolutely. I don't have it now because my body is tired. And I have a lot of ailments. I'm still touring, um, but I've I've been full of energy in my life and done a lot of things. So you're still touring. You still obviously love performing and things, and you play with Callum and Neil. Play with Callum or Neil. Don't play with both of them okay. anymore. It's not financially feasible. And on stage, it's better just to have two of you. Yeah. I love playing with both of them. They are absolutely wonderful to work with. It makes it very hard for me to work with anybody else. Yeah, yeah. You know? um, and we've played together since, let's see, Callum since he was 12, Neil since he was 14, I think, because they listened to music. They came to our concerts. They, sat, they heard music constantly in the house, mostly me practicing. So it's quite wonderful. To be with them now. Yeah. And do you? How do you find the folk scene now? I, I mean, don't know much about it. We're meant to be having another revival, aren't we? We're meant to be in another. What does another that mean? Folk revival. I don't know. I was going to ask you why it was a revival in the first time around. I mean, the the early sixties in London. There have been folk revivals since I think it was Sir Philip Sidney went out into the streets of London and told everybody, "Go and listen to the street singers. They'll be gone soon." In the sixteen hundreds. Then it would come back, and it would come back, usually fueled by middle class interest, or interest of of of, of older of of academics, or collectors. This country and Scotland, uh, and Ireland to a certain extent, Wales not, have been incredibly anthologized for people going out and collecting. 
collecting songs. There are a myriad, and we have the EFDSS, the English Folk Song and Dance Society, which is sponsored by the government. Uh, it is legitimized and has been so for nearly a hundred years. Uh, and so middle class interest, which is what I am, I'm middle class, I got interested in a different way. But an awful lot of um, academics, uh, historians of, of all sorts, mu musicians, went out and, like um, Cecil Sharp did in America, like Francis Child did, uh, went out and just nobbled a farmer or a miner or, you know, working class people, said, sing us what you know. And they wrote it down. They didn't say how it was sung. And because it was a dying, um, uh, the whole working class, even since I've been here, the whole way the working class uh, organization goes, a lot of those professions are completely disappeared. And folk music is community made. When the communities disappear, the folk music disappears. It fragments, it goes places, and you get old guys, old women, who maybe know something, but nobody ever asks them. Uh, but if they're asked, then they'll sing it for you, but their style of singing is gone. They're old. Well, I'm old. I'm 83. <laughs> uh, so they wrote down these songs. They wrote them down. And there's books and books and books and books of them. And there's even quite a lot of um, rough recordings made by various uh, fo uh, you know, collectors in America, like the Lomaxes, like the Corsons, like Sidney Cowell. Uh, a number uh, of them, like my father did, um, and they were put into a, an archive, like the EFDSS. In America, it's the Smithsonian. Smithsonian, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Oh, the, no, the Library of Congress, which my father was very instrumental in forming. Uh, the library at the Library of Congress. So um, that's where my mother went to get the recordings that she played, that we heard while we were children, over and over and over for the first ten years of my life, you know. Songs of women who'd murdered their husbands and, and chain gang songs and complaints from minors and whoa, little kids, not PC these days, but kids need that. They need it. They need to know where the coal comes, that people dig it up and they die down there. Uh, it's all pretty, pretty what kids get now. It is so pretty, pretty that it's, it stinks. It's like living on dessert all the time. That's a good one. First time I've ever used that. Okay, we've got it. Yeah, it is a good one. It's a good one. Yeah. So when you talk about the folk revival, you see how long I can take to get... I know what your question was. Talk about the folk revival and what I think of it. Uh, I don't go to enough folk clubs, which is one of my resolutions from for when I'm not so busy is to go to more clubs and see what people are actually doing. Oxford has a really good one that I go to where they don't sing American music all the time because British people singing American music gives me the... I don't sing British songs because my, my accent is wrong. My whole approach is wrong. I'm not British. Although I have sworn allegiance to the Queen. I mean, in Oxford, the one that's at the White House on Fridays is Excellent. You can hear songs there that you've never heard before. And for me, after 62 years of being here, that is something. Nice. Yeah. I mean, they have a, a Mickle Harp player there. They have people who turn up with, with odd songs from all over the place. And uh, it's, it, it's, it's not well attended. But the people who go there love it, and that's the main thing. They're not there for money. They're there for love. And that's, in a way, what our folk revival here has that to my knowledge, nowhere else in the world does it exist because the pub does not. Mm. It has been, it, it lives in pubs. It doesn't live in house concerts. In America, a lot of house concerts, but that's in a middle class home where a lot of middle class people get together. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they pay quite a lot for most folk clubs, unless you have a celebrity appearing. And folk celebrities, we are small compared to the Adele's and the and the Beyoncé's, and but but it's where I have always chosen to be. You and McCall and I chose to be there, uh, which is grassroots, which is where the songs came from. I mean, the people who come to 
the folk clubs, mind you, I'm not an authority on it anymore, and please put that in the thing, I'm not an authority. But in the past they used to be lower middle class, um, and the working people from an area, because the folk club would be in this small town, that small town. At one point there were 3,000 of them in the con country, I don't know how many now, but they were, I charted them at one point for three years. I collected the names of the folk clubs, and I had little forms I sent out. Uh, and they, they just sprang up, oh, let's start a folk club. And uh, the person who, standing next to the person who says that, says, what's a folk song? Oh, I don't know, but let's have a folk club, you know? Uh, so it was an urge to, in the common term these days, claw back culture from the top down we were producing from the bottom up. And that's where real culture comes from. Classical culture comes from top down. It comes from people who have studied and who play six or seven hours a day on the, on the violin or on the piano, which I did at one point. One point I was a good piano player. But um, the folk revival, I no longer know. I hear people sing folk songs and they do to them the most astounding things that take them right out of the style that they were made in. Do you worry that this will peter out as the, the generations move forward? It may, but it always comes up again because people want to sing themselves. They don't, you know. I don't get a lot of young people at my concerts. But I'll tell you, when they do come with their great-grandmothers who remember me, they, <laughs> they, they are stunned by the beauty of the songs. And sometimes they go home and they, they say, why haven't I found out about this before now? And there are always folk clubs they can go to, hopefully ones that nurture such interest. There are some good singers, but what happens here, and I think it's important to write it down, is that a lot of people who sing folk songs, and I hear a reasonable number of them on the radio, I hear them occasionally, people send me, is they tend to over-instrumentize them. Or they don't trust the text and they start jazzing it up with a style that they think is going to make it more interesting to people. I think that's probably an effort to make things more into the mainstream. But why should you want to do that? Yeah. Why would you want to do that? You know? Well, the industry has always done that. Yeah, but folk song started outside, the, outside yeah, of that. Of course, yeah. And to me, it belongs outside of that. It's, it, it, you know, you start, whenever I learn a new song, I learn it unaccompanied. I learn it with nothing added to it, because that way you can see what it's made of. This is what I do now. I didn't when I was younger, and I had some awful accompaniments, and please put that in too. <laughs> and I sang everything much too fast, which had I been part of a community where there were other older singers who would say, hold on, wait a minute. That song's lost its pulse. You've turned it into rhythm. What are you doing? Because pulse and rhythm are different. I would have said they're the same. Yeah, so, oh no, they're not the same. Is one having a beat? Pulse is the heart, feet are the rhythm. Okay. Dun, dun, ka dun, dun, ka dun, dun, which is why we like the duple, the dun, dun. Three, four is not natural to people who have two feet. Um, but when you sing unaccompanied, sometimes you drag the rhythm a little bit, sometimes you. You dwell on part of the, you know? I mean, if I was to sing, first to come down was dressed in red, next to come down was green, last to come down was Lord Dano's wife, as fine as any queen, queen. Well, the way Diller Chandler sings that, first to come down was dressed in red, next to come down was green, Last come down was Lord Dano's wife, as fine as any queen, queen, fine as any queen. That's pulse singing. Yeah. It's different. Yeah. And it's not mechanistic. Most of our music these days is mechanistic. We are an industrial complex. We get the music our society creates and deserves. And if this, which, which is why I love Tracy Chapman's singing. She just sings unaccompanied as marvellous. Mm. The voice just, 
just does everything and communicates emotions. You don't have to plonk emotions down on top of it. The voice just does it. And the first time ever I saw your face I thought the sun rose in your eyes And the moon and stars were the gift you gave to the dark and empty skies, my love. To the dark and empty skies.